Okay, so uh, in this one, we're going to go through some chemistry questions uh, for section three. So it's another kind of section three walkthrough uh, video. What I'm going to be doing with these is I'm going to be splitting them. So you might have seen yesterday, I put up the first of the crash course videos for physics. The difference between the two, I think we'll make this really clear, is the crash course videos are going to be for people who don't have a science background or for people who kind of need to work from level one all the way up. The, the walkthrough questions for section three, these kind of videos, are going to be for people who are maybe a bit more advanced in their, um, their study or their preparation for section three. So people who have already done a science degree and are feeling quite comfortable with it. Uh, and are looking more so for the strategies and that kind of thing um, and some of the technical analysis of the questions. That being said, if you don't have a science background, then you can still watch these videos and take a lot from them. They're designed to be as accessible as possible still. Uh, and likewise, vice versa, you know, if you're wanting to brush up on something from the crash course videos, then by all means, go ahead and watch those as well. They, they start from first principles and then work their way up. So you could easily skip some, some sections and then watch some of the bits that are more relevant to you as well. I also wanted to thank everyone for the comments that I've seen on a lot of the videos. It's been really, really good to see. Uh, a lot of people have messaged me uh, sent me emails, left comments saying good things about them, saying they're finding them really helpful, which is great to see. Uh, I didn't really, I mean, I, I'm a tutor by trade, right? So like I've done this for 11 years now, um, primarily teaching high school students, but I have tutored uh, university level uh, sciences and maths and that kind of thing as well. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's just really good to see that people are actually taking a lot from it. Um, they're finding it actionable. I know that a lot of the advice around Gamsat at the moment is just, is it, I mean, th there's some stuff that's good, but then people make you pay for it, which kind of sucks. Everything's put behind a paywall and there's YouTube videos and that kind of thing, but they're all teasers and they're just linking you to a course or something to make you pay for more, which I really don't like. Um, otherwise, it's just very, very vague. It's just this kind of broad, oh, well, here's how I did it, and then just leaving you in the ditch, basically. Um, I think it's better to actually go through it and look at specifics of how questions get broken down, actually answering questions from people and that kind of thing. So clearly that's uh, uh, helping people out, which is really good to see. Uh, and um, like I said, this is kind of what I do every day anyway. So um, it fits in really nicely, basically. So we're gonna go through some sample questions. These are ones that I've written up uh, to attempt to reflect the ASA material. I don't know how well they will. You can let me know in the comments anyway. Uh, and I will say it's a little bit shorter. These are much, much trickier. Organic chemistry is quite tricky to write questions. They're very, very content heavy. It takes a while to kind of go through, find the right uh, kind of foundations for it. I'll also say that obviously I do my best to reflect the ASA material, but these are not ASA questions in any way. Um, any of the material that I put up on the channel is all gonna be my own original work. Um, and so take from it what you will, right? All right. Let's get started. Uh, when I'm breaking down uh, organic chemistry questions, I'm usually just looking for pattern recognition a lot of the time. I'm still assisting that with chemistry knowledge, but I kind of accept that they're gonna throw bits of chemistry that you're not familiar with, and you're supposed to just use the reasoning aspect of it, basically. So we'll do this in this, and I'll point this out how you can actually kind of adapt to new bits of information without having to actually know the specifics. A lot of the time they're just seeing if you can take on new definitions, uh, new relationships and that kind of thing, and then extrapolate from there. All right, so if we look at this one here, so uh, benzoic acid is a stronger acid than acetic and acrylic acid, and research is being conducted into the impact of the sp2 hybridized carbon of carboxyl groups. Uh, sp2 hybridized carbons have greater electron withdrawing capability, or EWC, than that of sp3 hybridized carbons, and it's theorized that the increase in S character of hybrid orbitals is correlated with an increase in acidity. So breaking that down, what I'd be looking at first is just kind of understanding some of the definitions. So we've got sp2 greater EWC, and then the second thing is that that is more than sp3. So again, let's write that down. So I'm just gonna write like a rough note to myself that just says sp2 greater than sp3 because it seems to just be about electron withdrawing capability in some way. Uh, then we've got three of them ranked here and we're given the pKa values. And effectively this just confirms what was said at the very top. Benzoic acid is a stronger acid than these two. Its pKa value is smaller. Remember that p values are effectively using the negative log, just like the pH scale. 
So low actually means high or strong. So if you're measuring acidity through Ka, you actually want a low pKa. That would indicate a high Ka value. Uh, and then down here, we've got some definitions. So an electron withdrawing group is a highly electronegative group that stabilizes the carboxylate group of the conjugate base of most carboxylic acids and increases its acidity. So all I need here is EWG increases acidity. So I'm gonna put that in EWG, uh, and then I might just put the word like acid increase. Then I can also remind myself that means an uh, increase in Ka and therefore a decrease in pKa is more important given that's what this question seems to be focusing most on. Uh, then the EDG, so an electron donating group, uh, destabilizes the carboxylate uh, group of the conjugate base and this lowers it. So I'm not really going to put a note on that, it's kind of just the reverse of EWG so there's no need to um, I guess over notate or anything like that. And then the table below provides a summary of the possible substituents to the benzene ring of benzoic acid and their positioning with its relative impact on dissociation contents, uh, constants. So now we're kind of getting into some other variants of it. And you can see they're looking at para and meta organization of those substituents. And they're saying that here X is referring to the um, electron withdrawing group in some way. And we're just basically going to attach something X to this benzene ring uh, and then see what it does to the pKa values. With tables, I wouldn't really bother analyzing them too much. I'll wait until I see questions to know whether I'm looking for something increasing or decreasing, but I'm just kind of getting a gauge on what information is explicitly provided, but I'm not actually analyzing it for relationships or anything yet. So it's just a bunch of pKa values basically. And then question one then says, consider the following statements, blah, 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 we'll get through those. Which of the following are true? And so I just knock them out one by one, basically. So NH2 uh, is an EDG. So you can see it's using a lot of the jargony stuff now to try and throw us off. Um, NH2, which we'll look down here. And then we've got pKa values of 4.8 and 4.7. Now we know if it's an EDG or EWG based on what it does to the acidity. The pKa value of plain old benzoic acid was 4.2. And so that means that an increase in that would actually mean a decrease in acidity. And that was related to electron donating groups. And then a decrease in that would actually be an increase in acidity, which would mean an electron withdrawing group. And so this one was saying that NH2 is an EDG. So does it actually increase the pKa value? And so if we look here, 4.8, that is greater than 4.2. And here as well, because it didn't say anything about whether it's meta or para directing. Um, and so in both cases, it is an increase in the pKa, which is a decrease in acidity and therefore would be an electron donating group. So, so far that one's good. And I'd just be noting that down and going, okay, that one's a tick. Then para directing substituents form EWGs. So it didn't say which. So this is where what I would do here. This is something that I learned. I actually did a bunch of, I studied accounting after I did my science degree. Um, and even though it was quite dry, uh, it did teach a really, really good skill, which was uh, row analysis and column analysis when you like analyzing financial reports and stuff. Um, and I use this in a lot of the GAMSAT questions as well. So if I'm trying to look at the impact of uh, para directing, then I'm going to do a column analysis because it didn't say which of these, right? It is. So looking at it, all of these here, if it were to be that they're all EWGs, then EWGs should be increasing acidity and therefore decreasing pKa. You can see I'm just using my rule that I wrote up before, right? Because that's just immediately summarized it. Now I don't have to go back to the stem every time. Uh, and we can see here that the original was 4.2 and that would not be true because a good chunk of them here are all increasing. These are all EDGs. So para is not making exclusively EWGs. These down here would be EWGs because they're reducing it, but the statement says all. Uh, and then the impacts of paramethyl and metachloro substituents are equivalent. So this one's just a bit of jargony. We're going to look for each of them. So para and methyl, so we can see we've got, might switch colors, you can see we've got methyl, para, and there it is there. 
um, 4.4, that would be an increase of 0 0.2. And then it was metachloro, which is down here, that is a decrease of 0 0.2. So even though the absolute differences are the same, that is a difference in impact because one increased the acidity, the other one decreased the acidity. And so therefore that cannot be true. And so that one is wrong as well. And so we've ruled them all out. And so now the answer is just A. And there we go. We get our first one. So question two then, which of the following substituents form only electron donating groups in benzoic acid? And so with this one, it didn't say anything about meta or para. So we have to kind of cover all of those technically. And what I might do here is just get rid of some of this scribbling here for a moment. So which of the following only form EDGs? So remember EDGs increase the pKa value, which is a decrease in acidity. So we're looking for where they all increase. So if we look here, hydrogen doesn't have any impact because obviously that's just plain old benzoic acid. Uh, and then we look above and below and we can see that, so for example, NH2, OH and OCH3, we might just check each one. That's just these top three here. And it says, which the following only form EDG? Do they all increase the pKa? So here, these are all an increase. Here, however, those two are decreasing from 4.2 and this one's increasing, so not quite true. Uh, then we've got H, uh, Cl and Br. So you can already see H is neither because it's not actually changing it. So that one's out. And then Cl and Br. So we look down these two here and we check. So these two here are a decrease, right? And we're actually looking for an increase. So already that's going to be out, but we can see here these two decrease. But it is, you can see that it is uh, going the other way. It depends though, if we looked at the first one, that was dependent a little bit on whether we were talking about para or meta. Because if we were talking just about para, then that would mean that it all increases it. So in this case, the answer is going to be D. This depends on whether they're para or meta directed. So it's a bit of like a trick question. So in that question, just to kind of go back over it, because that's a lot of information to take in at once. Um, really, all we did was you just create rules, right? And I probably should have done this at the start. So EWG really just meant decrease pKa and EDG meant increase pKa. And as long as we take that with us, we can just kind of immediately answer the questions and you can translate a lot of what they're asking. So they're saying EDG. So really you could replace that and say, well, which of the following only increases pKa like that? And then all of a sudden the answer is a whole lot clearer. Uh, and in question three, so which of the following compounds will least readily dissociate in solution? So this one's a little bit relying on the definitions of acids or the way that we think about acids as interacting. So we know that strong acids will readily dissociate in solution, right? So here we're looking for least readily. So this means weakest acid and therefore the highest pKa value basically. And again, we just use that ruling. So it's a tricky way of basically asking you to rank based on pKa values. And if we go through them, we have to basically just use the table. So again, let's just clear off some of this junk and we'll look at each one. So just go through them one by one. If uh, A here is meta directing methyl, so methyl and meta directing 4.3, right? So that's not yet, it's the highest so far, but it's not necessarily the highest. So we keep going. Now we'll check B. So this is meta hydroxide. So 4.1, so no, that's no good. 4.3 is still the highest. It's an easy way to break it down like that. Then we've got a para directing OCH3 and para is 4.5. That's now the winner. So this one's out, this one's winning. And then finally D, we've got a meta directing chloride and that one is definitely not the highest. So that one's out and so the answer is C. Cool. So you can see again, that it, there's a little bit of chemistry knowledge, like understanding para and meta, for example, they usually define that in the question. I decided to leave that one out on this one because it is possibly examinable. Um, but the vast majority of the new information is all provided to you. And then you're supposed to use those definitions. That being said, a lot of people say, oh, you don't need any science knowledge. You can just rely exactly on what's in the question. You definitely can't. I think a lot of people who do science degrees kind of forget how much they rely on that science knowledge. 
and it is second nature for many people but for someone without a science background um it's it's not always going to be there it's not going to come like that there's a little bit of theory to to uh, brush up on and that's again what we'll do more in the crash course videos all right so moving along i'll zoom this one out a little bit so we've got it in view okay so uh this one was a fun one to write I had bent my head a little bit so the nazarov cyclization reaction is a uh, named is named an electric electrocyclic reaction uh, converting divinyl uh, ketones there's a lot of typos in there that I've just written uh, to cyclopentenones an example of a thermal ring opening reaction of 3,4-dimethyl cyclobutene is shown below the cis isomer yields the cis trans hexa 2,4-diene whereas the trans isomer gives the trans trans diene structure so again a lot of information but they usually when they're describing reaction pathways you can usually just look at the diagrams and it's summarized there so I usually read it, but I'm often like bouncing my gaze back down to the question and trying to match the bits and pieces of information. So I can see they haven't named this, but I would just assume, well, you know, that's that thing. And I go, ah, it's probably not important. I've got the structure in front of me. I'm not gonna to pay too much attention to the name now. Uh, and then here I go, okay, so they're just comparing cis trans versus trans trans products. And then I can see here's my cis structure with both the CH3s pointing upwards on the same side or out of the page and uh, here one directing up one directing down like that and that's the trans structure and I can see the impact on it. it just folds this bond down instead if it were to be the trans structure to make that and then I move on so now uh, it also says the same reaction can be applied to cyclopentenes so compound X shown below has been formed via the thermal ring opening reaction the following chemical reagents are being investigated as possible reagents used in that formation. Which of the above reagent or reagents could have been used to form compound X? So the first thing I would do is try to look at how this could be considered similar to something over here, right? And I can see it looks very, very much like that. All I'd have to do is add on an extra CH3 group and then I've got it. So that's already pretty good news. Um, and I just see that direct connection to it. Uh, it did say that it was from cyclopentenes. So a lot of these are uh, pentene rings. So I'm already leaning towards reagents one to three in that sense. And I don't really have any other information to go off. I would first try to visually see if I could wrap it back up into a, a cyclic structure again. Um, but for me personally, it's kind of bending my mind a little bit and I'd try, to, I'd try to avoid that. I think it would just kill way too much time for one question. So instead, what I'm gonna do is match it to the structure that I see here in the butene and see if I can extrapolate to the pentene and then look for more clues that might confirm that. So if I look at this here, if I take this structure, the double bond was one bond away from where the cis, or sorry, where the trans structure was occurring. So if I look at that and go, okay, well, where did the cis-trans thing change? And it was down here. So this bond and this bond are telling me that this, carb or this methyl group and this methyl group are trans-directed in that way. And they were one bond away from the actual double bond, right? And so if I do the same thing here, I go, okay, well, one bond away. So I'll put like that. And then I should have uh one going up one going down it doesn't really matter so ch3 and then another one going in the other direction ch3 and then i can see there's an extra methyl group so that would hint that it's probably a pentene ring and then i'm going to do that and now i'm going to match and see if i can find where that sits and i can see it matches to reagent two right now in this particular case there's no answer that says just two right and so i may have overthought that uh, and not realized that I could have been looking at it in a different way. I could have instead been thinking of it as a cis structure with a methyl group attached that way. And so all that would change about my scenario is that the original bond or the original uh, reagent was a cis structure, but otherwise the actual uh, like isomerism or the actual structure of the compound is exactly the same. So I don't have to go redrawing. I just go, well, they could either both be directing up or they could both be directing down. And then I can look at that and go, well, that matches with reagent two. So really it's gonna be 
one or two are possible. It's actually ambiguous from the product in this particular case. Um, I'd leave off reagent four because that would just be based on uh, them trying to see if you're gonna get tricked into just copying what's given over here uh, and not realizing that it also applies to cyclopentenes as well. Cool. Uh, then question five, so the products of ring opening reactions are. So with this one, we don't need the information from question four. We go back to the structures shown over here and I can remove all this stuff now. And you can see that really the difference between them is one is has a cis bond, the other one has a trans bond. So cis-trans is the only difference between them. And that is a type of stereoisomerism, right? And so this is really where a little bit of theory comes in and it's just testing what type of uh, compounds or what pairs are they. So we form cis-trans isomers in this ring opening reaction. Uh, and then they're definitely not structural, so that one's out. Uh, they're not enantiomers either, right? Those are optical isomers. Uh, a racemic mixture is actually a mix of two enantiomers, so that's also out. And by definition, cis-trans isomerism is a form of diastomerism, right? And then unit three, so I've put an asterisk on this one. Uh, this is not a real figure or anything. This is entirely made up by me. Uh, just to model off of the way that ACER write their questions. Uh, I'm pretty sure ACER always have actual factual information. Uh, I don't know how much research goes into building them, but uh, good on them for making them like that. I'm just going to make up something called a reductive value for the sake of a question itself. So don't make notes on this and think that this is a, a key part of chemistry. It's completely fake. Uh, cyclohexanes can... Oh, have. A lot of typos today. Uh, can have... <laughs> proves their originals. Uh, cyclohexanes can have hydrogens removed in a reaction that converts them to benzene compounds under high temperature and low pressure. The degree to which they can undergo this reaction at a set temperature and pressure is determined by. So what I can take from that immediately is even though it said high temperature and low pressure, because it said at a particular temperature and pressure, that's now out the window. I don't need to even think about temperature and pressure. There may be a question relating to remembering that it's high temp is good, low temp is good, but for the moment, if the reductive values are based on a set temperature and pressure, that's not fluctuating, right? So I don't need to worry about it. Uh, and so the degree to which they can undergo this reaction uh, at this set temperature and pressure is measured by what's called their reductive value that I've made up, uh, where those with lower RV values undergo conversion to a greater extent. The RV depends on the degree of chirality in the carbon ring. A table of RV values for the degree of chir chirality is shown below. Here we go. So the number of chiral carbons in the ring, zero through to six, and then the RV values that correspond to them. So which of the following pairs would have the same RV value? So immediately I'd be thinking more so about, well, what does RV actually measure or what's it directly connected to? And it's directly connected, even though we don't need another mathematical relationship, to the number of chiral carbons. So if two compounds have the same RV value, then they should have the same number of chiral carbons. And so rather than being given structures, we've got a pair of structural isomers. Immediately that one is gonna be out because if you can move compounds or you can move atoms around within a compound, you may go from it being chiral to achiral or changing the position of chiral carbons or creating more or less of them. So immediately we can't assume that the RV values would be the same. Uh, two compounds of equal molecular mass, that's kind of the same as A, right? It's, that's kind of the definition of an isomer of some sort. So that could be structural. So that's not enough to confirm it. Uh, two enantiomers, so these are then stereoisomers. And stereoisomers are, by definition, right, isomers that have chirality to them. And the difference in their structure is based on how those four substituents are actually arranged in three dimensions around that chiral carbon it doesn't mean that there are more or less chiral carbons. It's just how they're arranged around the same one. So that would be the strongest answer, but I would still check to rule out the others. Cyclohexanol and 1-chloro-1-fluorocyclohexane. So that one would require a little bit of scribbling on the scratch uh, paper. So I'll do my best to draw out a little hexane here. And then we're gonna make it cyclohexanol. So there we go. And then immediately we'll just draw the other one next to it like this, and it says 1-chloro-1-fluoro. So off of the same carbon, 
we have a chlorine and a fluorine like that. And so if I count out my chiral carbons, there's actually no chiral carbons in this one over here because it's symmetrical right down the center. And so really, even though this one looks like it could be chiral, uh, because this bond this way and this bond that way is exactly identical because it's a mirror image, they're actually equal and therefore they don't have four different substituents. So this one has zero chiral carbons. This one over here, pretty clearly that one's going to be your chiral carbon. That has one. And so immediately they have different numbers of chiral carbons and therefore they would have different RV values. So that one is also out. And then we've confirmed it is the two enantiomers. And then question seven, rank the following compounds in order of their extent of conversion to benzene compounds. Uh, and we've got four different structures shown. I'm purposely kind of messing with things a little bit by labeling them A, B, C, and D. And so some of them may be equal uh, in their degree of extent of conversion or the extent of their conversion. The trick to this one is you've got to go back and it says here, those with a lower RV value undergo conversion to a greater extent. So a lot of people would have been tricked into this thinking that, well, I just rank them by their RV values, but I've inverted the scale for the RV values. So the lower it is, that actually means greater extent, right? The difference was in the wording. So this one says rank them in the order of their extent. This one says the degree to which they can undergo it is just measured by their reductive value. Didn't say anything about an increasing in RV value means an increase in the degree. So you have to go by this extra clarification that's given second. So we're actually looking in this case, if lower is actually higher, then it means we want to rank them from low RV would be greater, right? In the degree or the extent to which they convert than high RV. And so I would go through them and just try to get their rough RV values, try to rank them. So with A, how many chiral carbons does it have? So this is asymmetrical. So it's got one here and then another one here. So that has two chiral carbons. This one over here, symmetrical. So it actually does not have any chirality to it. Uh, and so that one's zero. Then this one here, it's actually asymmetrical in this case, even though it's got the power directing OH and OH because of this throwing it off skew. So now this would be chiral, this would be chiral, and this here would also be chiral because if you look at the view from this side, this one has a, an amine group attached, whereas this way, no amine group attached. So those are technically considered different. So that would be the third one. And then finally we have this one here, which again is asymmetrical, so one and two. And so we can see that A and D are equal. So already I kind of know it's not gonna be D because that doesn't say that A and D are equal. But if we rank them low RV, that was B, should go to a greater extent uh, than A and D, which are both equal, right? Which is then greater than the extent of C with the highest RV value. And there we go. And so the answer then will be option C. All right. Um, and that's, yeah, that's everything there. Uh, so hopefully that's been helpful. Hopefully that's cleared up a few little things uh, and given you a bit of an insight into like how I would break them down. That being said, this is the way that I would break them down. I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. Uh, and obviously these questions I've written, so I already know where the answer is, but I'm doing my best to kind of explain how I would tackle them if I was doing them fresh, but I'm writing them so that they cover as many bases as possible in one video. I'll put these up as well. They should already be up actually on the resources page, which I'll link below as well. So you can go through a lot of these and if you want to redo them, and I actually link the video at the top of the page so you can kind of re-watch it and go through the work solutions when you've you've had a crack at them yeah other than that i'll i'll keep doing these i think there's obviously going to be a greater emphasis on chemistry and physics for these videos but i'll try to get in some biology stuff as well just let me know what it is that you'd like to see uh, and next up will be a crash course video for chemistry as i mentioned because it's for people with no science background it will start in in the basics in the foundations but uh, feel free to use the timestamps and kind of skip ahead because it'll move quite quickly into more advanced stuff as well as we go through. All right, cool. I'll see you in the next one.